So today we have pediatric resuscitation and newborn resuscitation with including arrhythmias. And we'll be having some simulation demonstration as well. And uh, today we have moderator, Dr. Jairaj Brahm Kumar. He's nothing new, he's not a new person to us and we are all, uh, uh, he worked with us and we know him very well and he's doing the DM residency in cardiac intensive care at All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. He completed his MD, MBBS and MD pediatrics from CMC Ludhiana. And he worked with us for about two years as a senior resident and fellow in the pediatric intensive care at CMC Velo. And Jairaj, we are very happy to welcome you to moderate today's session. And thank, thank you, you for accepting our invitation and over to you to introduce the speakers and um, topic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity given, sir. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Vandana Pandey. She is uh, currently the assistant professor in uh, PICU at CMC Bello. Uh, she finished her DCH in MD Pediatrics at uh, CMC Bello, and then she did a fellowship in Pediatric Emergency Medicine in the Pediatric Emergency at CMC Bello. Uh, her uh, interests are uh, in uh, the early warning scores, resuscitation, and CAR team management also she does in uh, uh, in the uh, pediatrics department. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Shanu Chandran. He is an assistant professor in the department of neonatology at CMC Valor. He finishes MBBS at Alapi Medical College, followed by MD Pediatrics at JIPMA. And then he further on uh, is, uh, did his DM neonatology at CMC Valor. Thank you, uh, Jairaj. We'll just move on to this uh, topic of today. So what is our plan is we'll be doing on pediatric uh, BLS and CPR and uh, some arrhythmia lesions depends on the time and then followed by the newborn resuscitation, Dr. Sean who will take over. And uh, then we have the demonstration simulation. Uh, I will just start with the, the introduction for the CPR and then uh, and Dr. Vandana will take, uh, take over from me and then discuss about the pediatric resuscitation video clips. So what is this picture when you see this? Any clue? So this is supposedly the CPR. This is um, biblical aspects that is given uh, to the son of Shunammite lady. So he it is given in Bible. Uh, he fell, I laid on the child three times and mouth to mouth. So we don't know much about that. But this is about the modern CPR. This slide shows Peter Safar, who is the father of uh, or a pioneer in the modern CPR with the, another Dr. Khalil Lam. And they both were in, in very much pioneering about the CPR and a lot of resuscitation starting from 1950s and in 60s. So what all so far we have had the impact of CPR on health in survival, life impact, economic and functional. So you need to see if you do, if we look at survival, we talk about the ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, sustained risk, survival to hospital discharge like that. Then life impact then talked about, that means cognition is preserved. And then the daily health related quality of life, emotional well-being. Economic impact also, how much, uh, how long the patient has been in ICU post cardiac arrest care in duration of hospital, say, financial impact on the individual. Then comes the functional recovery. That means uh, all, whether he is supported, all his organs are supported for a long time or lifelong, or is independent of that. So we know that as CPR in children, it's not like uh, adults. It, even in children, we have child, infant, and newborn. And we cannot custom, uh, we cannot have the same extrapolation from the adult world as we know. But for uniformity, certain things like CAB, right? Chest compression starting, then airway breathing. And this is also after much deliberation, after looking at a lot of research, they have come out with. But otherwise, there are much differences are there. As we know, this like you need, you see in an adult, there is cardiac arrest is mainly due to a cardiac issue, like a myocardial infarction. If a suddenly an adult collapses, the sound and rhythm is the ventricular fibrillation. 
where the shock is more important than CPR. In children, is mostly respiratory failure, hypotensive shock, leading on to cardiopulmonary failure, which lead on to cardiac. But yes, there is a, uh, about 5 to 7% of the children might have a direct cardiac events. That's what we talk about that as well, because if you recognize early, the outcome is very good. And uh, now, Dr. Vandana, can you please talk about all this and then we'll take it forward. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we'll go through the phases of cardiac arrest and CPR. This is very important to know because uh, in what stage we are we catching the children and what, what we have to do is very important when we are scientifically proven that cardiac, if cardiac CPR is given to a cardiac arrest child, it, it means a lot to the child. So pre-RS, there will be some uh, changes in the uh, vital signs. And when we catch these children before pre-RS, there is a uh, chance that we avert the um, eventuality of a cardiac arrest. So it, by rapid response systems or a few score that we can use, we can call for help and uh, uh, avert this situation of a cardiac arrest. But when cardiac arrest happens, there will be a phase of no flow to the heart and to the vital organs of mainly brain and kidney. And there will be a low flow after that uh, where a CPR is being given. CPR is not 100% valid that it will uh, cause full cardiac output. So there will be a low flow system where the, only the uh, vital organs of heart and cardiac muscle only can be perfused. So this is a very uh, critical situation where we have to have correct CPR being given. So, uh, so push hard, push fast are the co uh, quality indicators of CPR when we are giving in a low flow situation uh, CPR. So when this resuscitation is um, um, good or if the child survives this resuscitation, then there will be post arrest stabilization that we have to consider where uh, there, there should be correct blood pressure monitoring, temperature monitoring, uh, of course, glucose and um, uh, ventilation uh, should be perfect when a child recovers from this. So seizure, seizure control also should happen because hypoxia is a, uh, in the event of hypoxia, seizures can affect. So uh, if, if we are uh, having a goal-directed care for all these things and having in mind of uh, all these things, whenever we are giving CPR to a child, it will be um, uh, good and beneficial uh, because uh, in hospital or out of hospital, around 4% of uh, children who, who are given CPR only be, make it uh, alive to the um, uh, out of hospital areas. Okay, so we'll see what goes on with CPR. Um, next slide. So this was the uh, uh, schedule we had. Uh, the the chart that algorithm that you have on the left side was the one 2020 uh, AHA BLS. Uh, pediatric protocol where we have to uh, recognize the shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm and then give um, CPR uh, and of course adrenaline work has to be given as soon as possible. But then COVID-19 came and it changed everything. So the yellow things that are written on the uh, um, follow chart on the right side are the changes which AHA has recommended in 2021. So we have to don PPE uh, 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 as soon as possible and also prioritize to intubate the child and decrease the aerosol generation, uh, aerosol uh, exposure to the healthcare concern. Uh, but uh, Australasian, the, in the next slide, we can see uh, that Australasian countries have very less uh, um, incidence of uh, COVID in their uh, country. So they have made a different protocol. Next slide, sir. So they don't want any uh, aerosol to be generated uh, at all. Um, of course, we'll go through this high quality CPR, which uh, um, uh, we all know that high quality CPR indicates that it has to be performed at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute. And CPR, um, the, chest, uh, the ratio of the chest compressions depends on the age of the child. Uh, so it is if and the number of personnel that are available. Usually when um, uh, outside the hospital, we where single rescuer is the norm, then 30 is to 2 is used for child and infant. And uh, when two rescuers are there, it is 15 is to 2. These these are the basics of CPR and of course when we are performing high quality CPR we have to be the heart and the lungs of the uh, patient who has uh, I mean arrested so we have to push hard hard enough that the chest um, the, uh, the cardiac output can be reaching the vital organs and push fast because the normal heart rate uh, varies from 100 to 120 in a child we should push fast as into that rhythm and allow chest recoil recoil uh, allows the uh, cardiac 
um, 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 perfusion. So we have to allow for chest recoiling and for the venous return. And of course, we should never minimize interruptions. We should never go more than uh, 10 seconds to 6 to 10 seconds of interruption in any CPR. And of course, avoid hyperventilation uh, uh, to avoid pneumothorax and of course, the uh, venous return. And early defibrillation of a shockable rhythm is very important. That too, when we have uh, witness arrests which are in the hospital, which are more of cardiac or origin. So this is the pediatric chain of survival. Each component is very important. Uh, out of hospital uh, cardiac arrest and in hospital cardiac arrest have a different chains of uh, uh, links. Uh, links in in hospital um, hosp cardiac arrest. The main thing is early recognition and prediction of a um, deterioration. So that is a may first link in in hospital. And of course, uh, calling for help, correct uh, uh, high quality CPR, and then uh, resuscitation with a defibrillator post cardiac arrest. And recovery mean a lot in inpatient cardiac arrest. Whereas in outpatient cardiac arrest, uh, uh, prevention is better than cure. So we have to uh, have all the safety measures of uh, a, a child or a baby uh, while, you are while we are traveling or uh, any measure uh, that can be averting this cardiac arrest should be done. And uh, early recognition, uh, high quality CPR and transport with, with uh, uh, transport quality also has to be very good in out of hospital uh, um, cardiac arrest and then recovery and uh, family counseling goes hand in hand. So child BLS actually, as I said, is divided into two uh, parts, which is very um, um, different from um, adults. In adults, usually it is witness arrest uh, because they can tell what is going on in uh, in the. I mean, if they have a chest pain or if they have a uneasiness, they usually tell us. But in child, it is usually unwitness arrest. So unwitness arrest is is most probably a respiratory arrest. Whereas a witness arrest, when uh, actually when you are watching the child and the child has sudden arrest, that is cardiac. So the, there are two different types of uh, arrest. So if you're unwitnessed arrest, you have to provide uh, chest compressions or bag and mask and then go for help. But whereas in witness arrest, you need a um, defibrillator urgently. So we have to go run for a defibrillator as soon as possible. We'll watch a video of uh, child BLS now. You've learned BLS for adults, but what if the victim had been a child? Hey, Daniel, are you okay? There are important differences between BLS for children and for adults. Under the American Heart Association BLS guidelines, anyone from the age of one to puberty is considered a child. For these BLS guidelines, puberty is defined as chest or underarm hair on males and any breast development on females. When performing compressions on a child, use one or two hands, whichever allows you to provide deep, effective compressions. Compress to a depth of at least one third the depth of the chest, about two inches or five centimeters, allowing the chest to recoil completely. If you are unable to compress to the correct depth with one hand, either due to fatigue or lack of upper body strength, Use two hands to provide ongoing high-quality compressions. For a single rescuer for victims of all ages, use a compression to ventilation ratio of 30 compressions to two breaths. If you are in a two rescuer team for children, the ratio should be 15 compressions to two breaths. Delivery of breaths to children requires less volume and force, but you still need to use enough air to see the chest rise. There are some differences in when to activate the emergency response system. If you did not witness the arrest and are alone, you should perform five cycles of CPR before you leave the child to activate the emergency response system. If the arrest is sudden and witnessed, leave the child, activate the emergency response system, get the AED or defibrillator, then return to the child. As you can see, there aren't a lot of differences between adult and child CPR, but they are important ones. So uh, when we are giving chest compressions, we have to make sure that at least one third of the depth of the chest is actually compressed and it returns back uh, again. Um, so when we say child, we, we, have to, we, we can say five centimeter, whereas in the adults it is six centimeter and in infant it is actually four centimeter.
we have to allow for complete recoil as i said because the uh, uh, cardiac muscle is perfused during this recoil um, um, phase of this cpr now coming to the breaths uh, this is very important because uh, um, uh, the first breaths are very um, important to perfuse the brain and the cardiac muscle so we use ec technique the uh, uh, with both the hands uh, c is the two fingers of the thumb and the index finger around the um, uh, fitting a mask with the, around the fitting mask and e around uh, on the mandibular mandibular bony prominence so we form a c and a e so that we have a snug fit of the mask so we have to give two breaths every uh, for every 30 compressions and if you have any help we can make it uh, 15 is to 2 but if there are two or more uh, uh, rescuers there then two people can uh, uh, can be uh, doing the uh, compressions and the airway um as i said compression to ventilation ratio when you we have two or more rescuer is 15 is to 2 when we are single and we we have only a bag and mask then we have to do 30 is to 2 when two rescuers are there we can form a double c around the mask and double e around the mandibular area so that it is tightly and fitly snugly um, given uh, we can give bag and mask so this technique is very very important because when we have two when we have two or more rescuers present then we can have a double c and double e method of uh, uh, securing the airway uh, two two uh, thumbs and the fingers around the uh, mask and the e around the mandibular area so this will give a uh, give good snugly fit uh, um, uh, ma um, uh, mask area for uh, good uh, aeration Uh, uh, coming to the infant cpr we have to there are some differences between the infant cpr and the child cpr uh, in infants we can uh, when we are checking for the scene safety and uh, for the response of the child and pulse there are some differences we have to tap the child on the gently on the um, uh, soles and of course see the pulse on the uh, upper arm um, up, uh, up immediate upper arm of the baby uh, don't try to palpate the uh, pulse but just feel the pulse if there there is a pulse or not but here we have to take our own time of 6 seconds and count gently how many uh, heart rate uh, beats that we feel for and then divide uh, multiply it by 10 and so that we can get the total uh, heart rate if the heart rate is less than 60 then we go ahead and do chest compressions Shall we watch a video of infant CPR? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So this is the old method that they were saying. Two fingers are enough for uh, giving a C, uh, infant CPR. Uh, this is around one one finger breath below the nipple area. As you see, uh, he's putting his two fingers and compressing uh, using the sternum as the fulcrum. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Yes, Dr. Vandana was saying this is the previous version. There are a couple of things you need to note in here. Is the count hundred is mentioned here? It is hundred to one twenty. Okay, now it's hundred to one twenty in the that is the compression rate. Compression rate. Fifth, and seven, uh, eight, uh, nine, the 20, technique 20, we can 20, use 20, a thumb 20, encircling 20, also 20, 20, 20, if you 20, are a single 30. rescuer it's not only the two finger technique 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 26 27 28 29 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 38 39 40 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 
Switch students. There is a difference of bag and mask also in, in children. Clip, you Let's will learn it. using bag and mask device to provide rescue breath for infants. Make sure you have the right size mask so that it's not too big for the baby. Remember, chest rise is the most observable sign to determine the effectiveness of your rescue breaths. First, position yourself directly above the infant's head. Place the mask on the victim's face using the bridge of the nose as a guide. Use the thumb and index finger of one hand to make a C to press around the edges of the mask. The remaining finger of the hand should form an E. Lift the angle of the jaw and open the airway. Remember, too much of extension of infant's head can further block the airway. Make sure you hold the mask against the face with your thumb and index finger. While using the remaining fingers of that hand to lift the jaw and open the airway. Make sure you make a tight seal between the mask and the infant's face. Squeeze the bag with your other hand to deliver just enough breath to make the chest rise. Deliver each breath over one second. If the chest does not rise, you are not providing adequate breaths. Adjust the mask, reposition the head and neck and administer a larger amount of air. Uh, so we have to know the infant's uh, ratio of compression and ventilation also. It, if we are two rescuers are there, if, as usual in the hospital, that is 15 is to 2. But when we are single or outside, uh, then it will be 30 is to 2. Same as the children, um, child also. So, um, uh, so infant CPR also, if we have two rescuer, we have to perform chest compressions at 100 to 120 uh, uh, per minute. At least one third of the depth of the chest should be compressed, approximately one and a half inch or four inch, four centimeter. And we have to allow chest recoil after each compression and always remember to count aloud because uh, I might be an untrained nurse uh, standing there and I, I want to do something else, then I won't be um, tuned to what should be done it is better to count aloud when we are whenever we are giving cpr so this is as per the 2020 guidelines these are the three important things about high quality about chest compression push fast push hard push fast is 100 to 120 and the push hard and allow recoil so these are the important points Remember, there are some important differences while performing two rescuer versus one rescuer CPR on an infant. This includes a different hand placement and a different compression to breath ratio. In single rescuer, just compression is performed with one hand and the other hand is placed on the forehead of the baby to gently tilt the head back and keep the airway open. In a two rescuer, since there is a second rescuer who is designated person for the airway, the first rescuer can use both of his hands for the purpose of chest compression. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Do not press on the tip of the breastbone. In an infant, because of the small size of the chest, your thumbs may overlap during compressions. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 1, 2, in case of an infant, the rescuer can switch roles after every 10 cycles of CPR to prevent fatigue. In this clip, we will review 
all the steps of infant BLS in one go. Baby, baby, there is no response. If you have someone around to help you, then you stay by the victim's side and begin the steps of BLS while you ask the other person to activate the emergency response system and get EED. She's not breathing. Activate the emergency response. There is no pulse. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. When second rescuer arrives, you switch to ratio of 15 compressions and 2 breaths. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. In an infant CPR, rescuers switch roles after every 10 cycles of CPR to prevent fatigue. Um, now we'll go through the automated external defibrillator, how we can use it. Um, usually this doesn't need any charging or uh, it is usually can be carried to the field. It is a small box type of um, uh, device which has only three steps. Universally, two, three steps are uh, connected to it. So the first step usually will be the connecting the pads. So the pads are different for adult and for child. If you don't get a child um, pads, we can use one at the posterior uh, back and one in the heart area. And the adults, of course, it is in the pre, um, um, both in the apex and in the uh, mammary area on the right. So we'll watch a video about it. There's no pulse. One, two, three, four. Remember, five, six, push hard seven, and fast, eight, nine, at least ten, two inches seven, or five four, centimeters. 14, 14, His chest 15, needs to completely 15, recoil 15, after each 15, compression. 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Analyze Everybody clear? Heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. Although AEDs may differ slightly, there are four universal steps for operating an AED. First, turn on the AED. Open the carrying case or the top of the AED, then turn the power on. Some devices will power on automatically when you open the lid. The AED will guide you, but it's still critically important that you know these steps. Some AEDs may have adult and pediatric pads. Make sure you use the adult pads on anyone eight years of age and older. Peel away the backing from the pads. Following the pictures found on the pads, attach the adhesive pads to the victim's bare chest. Place one pad to the side of the left nipple. Place the other pad on the victim's upper right chest directly below the collarbone. If instructed by the AED, clear the victim and analyze the rhythm. 11. Analyzing 12. heart rhythm. Do not touch Analyzing. the patient. Let's switch. Shock needed. Charging. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing button. Shock advised. Button clear. Now. Be sure that no one is touching the victim, not even the person in charge of giving breaths. Ideally, you will pause CPR during or immediately after a set of compressions. Some AEDs will tell you to push a button to allow the AED to analyze the heart rhythm. Others will do that automatically. The AED may take about 5 to 15 seconds to analyze the rhythm. The AED then tells you if a shock is needed. If the AED recommends a shock, it will tell you to clear the victim and push the shock button. Again, be sure no one is touching the victim to avoid injury to rescuers. Then loudly state a clear the victim message. It can be something like, everybody's clear, or simply clear. Perform a visual check to ensure that no one is in contact with the victim. Shock advised, clear. Press the shock button. 
The shock may produce a sudden contraction of the victim's muscles. As soon as the AED gives the shock, immediately resume CPR, beginning with chest compressions. Do not remove the AED or turn it off. The AED will repeat the analyze and shock cycle every two minutes. No shock needed. When the AED indicates no shock advised, you do not check the pulse first. You are also some you'll need to consider when using an AED. If a victim has hair on his chest, the hair may prevent the pads from sticking. The AED may tell you to check the pads. If this happens, press the pads down more firmly. If they still aren't sticking, rip the pads off forcefully, removing the chest hair. Then reapply a new set of pads to the bare skin. If your AED supply kit has a razor, you can use this to shave the area as well and then reapply a new set of pads. Water on the victim's chest could allow the shock to travel through the water between the pads and prevent delivery of an effective shock dose to the victim's heart. If someone is lying in water, you should quickly move the victim to a dry area. If the victim is lying on snow or in a small puddle, you may use the AED. If the chest is covered with water or sweat, wipe the chest before attaching the AED pads, but wipe the chest quickly as it doesn't have to be completely dry. Some people have implanted pacemakers and or defibrillators in the same place where you would put the AED pads. The device will look like a round or square lump smaller than a deck of cards. If you see this lump, try to avoid putting the pad directly over the lump. Do not place the pad directly over a medicine patch. If the shock delivery will not be delayed, take the patch off and quickly wipe the chest before you put on the pad. We've talked about the differences in compressions and breaths for children and infants, but now let's cover the difference in the use of an AED for an infant or child under eight years of age. Some AEDs have been modified to deliver different shock doses, one shock dose for adults and one for children under eight. If you use a pediatric capable AED, there are features that allow it to deliver the child appropriate shock. Which feature is available depends on the type of AED you are using. If your AED includes a smaller size pad designed for children, use it. If not, use the standard pads, making sure they do not touch or overlap. The important thing is to be familiar with the AED you will be using, if possible, before you actually need to use it. When you are using an AED, Remember to turn it on first and follow the prompts as it leads you through the rest of the steps. For infants, a manual defibrillator is preferred to an AED for defibrillation. If a manual defibrillator is not available, an AED equipped with a pediatric dose attenuator is preferred. If neither is available, you may use an AED without a pediatric dose attenuator. So the important point uh, you need to remember here is about the automated external delivery. It may not look like whatever they shown. It might be different, but the steps are the same. Switch on, follow the prompts. And uh, analyzing the rhythm, you have to take the hands off. In between, you may have to give compression as it is mentioned. It might go more than 15 seconds sometimes. So our dictum is uh, not uh, minimize interruption. The 10 seconds is a cutoff any time to take off the hand. So while analyzing, you may take off. And then second is when the shock is delivered, that is semi-automatic, you can press the orange button. So we'll go through the uh, summary of the high quality CPR components of BLS providers. Scene safety, ma making sure the environment is safe, like pulling out a child or a, uh, a person who is in the swimming pool or in the water out of the danger area. Or if you have a uh, child has uh, crashed down in a treatment room and there are needles around. So scene safety is the same for child, adult and an infant. Adult, we mean adolescents are above eight years of age or till puberty. And then uh, we have recognizing 
assessing the cardiac arrest uh, and uh, checking the response d depends on the size of the child, but it actually has to be finished within 10 seconds. That is the same in everybody. And then activation of emergency response system it differs in adults, children and infants because it witnessed collapse in um, uh, can be for uh, we can follow the adult algorithm and call for help. But unwitnessed uh, collapse, we have to give at least two minutes of CPR and then only leave the child and go. And uh, uh, compression ventilation ratios differ in adults and children and infants. Adults, it's always 30 is to 2. But in children, we have to add more uh, breaths per minute, so it becomes 15 is to 2. Then um, the uh, compression um, uh, uh, airway, uh, comp uh, I, I mean, the uh, number of uh, breaths that you give is the same. We have to give one breath every six seconds in everybody. And the rate also 100 to 120 is the same. But the compression depth differs in adults. It is five centimeter. And in children, it is two inches or below five centimeter and four in infants. Hand placement differs because we can use a lower part of the breastbone in adults or the sternum uh, as a fulcrum. We can use uh, two hands on the uh, uh, two hands or uh, one hand, most probably two hands because the adults will be bigger. But children above eight years, we can use one hand, and uh, it is usually in the lower half of the uh, sternum. But in chill, uh, in babies, it comes to the nipple area or one finger below the nipple area. Uh, uh, so the children are in between. So we can uh, see the upper part of the breastbone and chest recoil uh, allowing chest recoil is the same in all the uh, age groups and minimizing interruptions goes without saying that it should be less than 10 seconds uh, uh, when we are uh, doing uh, bls or we are thinking about child why is he not recovering or we have a pea child with no pulse then we have to think about four hs and uh, some Sorry, 60s and 6 Hs. So hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ions, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, and hypothermia have to be checked. And uh, T's also. Tension pneumothorax, we have to ascultate for that. Cardiac tamponade also, we have to see the muffling of the heart sounds. Toxins, if any, involved. And pulmonary thrombosis and coronary thrombosis are mainly adults, but we, we have to check for them also. Yeah. So in summary, actually CPR is a continuing process. Uh, we'll go through the choking uh, uh, algorithm. Now, um, as I said, uh, CPR is a continuous process. Uh, and every two minutes, we have to reassess the heart, re heart rate, rhythm, check the rhythm. And if it is a shockable or non-shockable, we have to decide. And uh, we have to consider advanced airway at any point uh, when we are reassessing every two minutes and monitor the CPR quality also. And uh, the other drugs uh, that can be used in uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, life support are epinephrine, amiodaron, lidocaine. Uh, these are all specifically used for some conditions uh, that um, we will see in the arrhythmia classes. And um, uh, always remember the reversible causes. If you correct them, actually, uh, the uh, uh, treatment of cardiac arrest is very easy. Now, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Vandana. So, we will not do the choking now because we start a little late and want of time. If there is time later, we can do that. So, in summary, as she said, I will want to add some more points in that. I want to re emphasize the point about high quality CPR. And you need to know the difference between an adult, child, and infant, which is very important. And when we have a single rescuer and a two rescuer, what are you supposed to do? The compression ventilation ratio changes. So because, uh, you see, even when we are doing a perfect high quality CPR, about 25 to 30% of the cardiac output only matched. So you understand how it's important to give the high quality CPR. Okay, thank you, Vandana. We'll move on to the arrhythmias. Uh, just keep this choking. And uh, so in pediatric cardiac arrest, uh, we talked about all the basic life support. But when you are in a hospital setup, you have the advanced life support. That means, so you have an ECG monitored and the child's cardiac arrest rhythms can be seen. So this is the four rhythms, which is mentioned here, is the same for adult, child, or an infant. It can be asystole, pulseless electrical activity. These two are called non-shockable rhythms, and ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia, which are the shockable rhythms. We'll go little detail about that. 
this is the cardiac arrest algorithm dr vandana show in the beginning and you have you would have seen this there are two pathways one is for a non shockable rhythm which is asystole and pulseless electrical activity and another one is for the shockable that is ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia all right so the sequence is when we uh, go through the demonstration also we will be seeing that in uh, here where I'm, what i am going to say how show is how to identify that so one important change in this 2020 ha is about the uh, early uh, epinephrine in a non shockable rhythm non shockable rhythm you are only giving cardiopulmonary cpr chest compression bag and mask ventilation and epinephrine has come very early it is has to be asap and then you continue three to five minutes and every five cycles are every two minutes you may switch over while you are switching over you check for the pulse and carotid in adult and a child brachial in an infant and then the rhythm and when we check the rhythm if you have a ventricular fibrillation or a pulseless ventricular tachycardia we call it a shockable rhythm and it is there, there is a role for defibrillation we'll go through this this cardiac arrest there is so this you are seeing a flat line that is what we call asystole but remember, we are not treating the rhythm, we treat the patient. So you need to check the beads are connected and the pulse is there or the child is moving. So it's very important. When you have a flat line, you need to look at like this. But in adult, when especially when they sing, they may think about a finer VF also. So they may amplify it and see. But in children, we don't look into that, but mainly a flat line will check the chest leads and then it is a systole. But you have a rhythm like this. It may not be perfectly like a sinus rhythm. It may have some rhythm with some heart rate around 60, 70, but there is no pulse. We call it as pulseless electrical acti activity or the PEA. Okay, this is one we saw is the asystole. A systole is the fat line, then is the pulseless electrical activity. You may have some rhythm with a low heart rate, but there is no perfusing rhythm, that is no pulse. And now you are seeing some that two are called non shockable. And what we are seeing in this is a white complex. What we're seeing is the white complex, right? And there is no pulse. What is it? It's the pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Pulseless ventricular tachycardia degree of coordination so you may see like this in the monitor you have a white complex tachycardia no pulse you call it as pulseless okay. you are seeing something on the monitor how to describe this this is what we could describe a disorganized rhythm that's like a scribbling pattern right pulse this ventricular fibrillation these two are the shockable rhythms see the difference between the ventricular tachycardia it's like a white Guardian. complex here it's Do like a chaotic rhythm just a chaotic rhythm Okay, so when you come to this is these two or these four rhythms are the cardiac arrest rhythms, that is, when there is no pulse, you see asystole, you see pulseless electrical activity, you see the pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. There are some more rhythm disturbances are there. I'm just keeping that because want of time difference. But when you have rhythm, when you talk about them in children, you can see it in we already discussed that is a systole again i'm saying flat line some rhythm but no pulse that is pulseless electrical activity and we have a chaotic disorganized rhythm and no pulse that is pulse ventricular fibrillation and next you have a white complex and there is no pulse it's pulseless ventricular tachycardia so ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia are the shockable rhythm now we may have a slow pulse that's called bradyarrhythmia 
and may have a fast pulse that's called tachyarrhythmia. Right, when we have subnormal that's slow or a fast, you may ask these questions. That's what I put. One is the palpable pulse are absent. We already discussed about that. When there is no pulse, it will be in a cardiac arrest rhythm. But if the pulse rate is abnormally low or fast, you ask this, this bradyarrhythmia or a tachyarrhythmia. So always remember, we treat the patient. So you need to look at the hemodynamic status of the patient. Then you look at the QRS nature of the patient, uh, ECG, or in the monitor, whether it is narrow or wide. So wow, when will you say narrow or wide, we'll see in the next. And then we'll see the diagnostic pattern to the ECG. That is also is whether very important, especially regular and irregular. See, irregular atrial tachycardia, AF and all, we'll see more commonly in adults. But the regular things, what is sinus tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, and a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is commonly seen in children. So that when we see this uh, ECG or in the monitor, you look at the P waves and then the QRS as well. This I already discussed. And now we are seeing one patient with having a heart rate around 50 is bradycardic, but pulse is there. So when you talked about bradycardia in a child, sinus bradycardia, always remember this Vandana also talked in her CPR algorithm. In a neonate or an young infant, when the heart rate is less than 60, despite adequate oxygen, 60 with poor perfusion, despite adequate oxygenation, you have to start CPR. What is adequate oxygenation? Sometimes the baby is not breathing well or is having a shallow breathing or apnea. You need to give bag and mask and then. Uh, then if the heart rate is not coming up, you have to start CPR. Remember, in sign of bradycardia, primary bradycardia is the most, secondary is the most common cause, that is the hypoxia. Secondary to hypoxia is the most common cause and then followed by hypothermia like that. Not the primary bradycardia due to heart blocks is not that common in children. So these are the pediatric bradycardia algorithm and uh, we are not going since it is due to secondary bradycardia, the oxygen, adequate oxygenation, probably there may be a roll of epinephrine. Atropine has role only in primary bradycardia, that is the heart block or if there is a vagal response to that. So again, I'm telling if the heart rate is less than 60 with poor perfusion, despite adequate oxygenation, you have to start CPR. And next, abnormally fast pulse, that is tachyarrhythmias. In adults, they call, see, when we say tachycardia, that's a difference. In adults, 100 and above, we say tachycardia. Adults, more than 150, is abnormally fast. In children also, that is age-wise heart rhythm, uh, heart rate uh, age-related is there, cutoff is there. But when you say more than 180 in a child, more than eight years, is abnormally fast. Here you might think it may be a tachyarrhythmia like SVT or something else that is just to consider infants if it is more than 220. Then we talked when there is a tachyarrhythmia, you look at the QRS complex. If the child in child is 0 0.09 seconds, there is more than three small squares, more than sorry, more than two small squares in a child, one small square is 0 0.04. And if it is more than two small squares, and uh, that is, um, uh, that is, uh, then we'll call it as white QRS, okay? In adult, it is more than three. In children, it is more than two small squares. Okay, this is the 2020 HA tachycardia uh, algorithm, tachyarrhythmia algorithm. So here important thing, I'm what I'm showing here is the cardiopulmonary compromise. You are seen in the monitor or ECG, the heart rate is abnormally fast. So what do you look at the patient now is the patient, is it compromised cardiopulmonarily, hemodynamically? If it is yes, then you look at the QRS, it is narrow, wide, even if it is no, you look at the QRS again, narrow or wide and go, right? So the hemodynamic compromise is very important step in going again, approaching a child with tachyarrhythmias. When you have a narrow QRS, that is, I said, less than 0 0.09 seconds, mainly supraventricular wide, that is more than 0 0.09, it is possible ventricular tachycardia. So we have a child probably with a heart rate more than 212 like this. This we are seeing is the narrow complex ECG squares less than 0 0.09, less than two, might say supraventricular tachycardia. You have to consider. 
So how do you differentiate between sinus and tachycardia SVT? There are many points are there, but I would like to tell you there are three important things. When a child comes to you with the, on an emergency, you connected and you're abnormally fast heart rate, you look at their uh, monitor. ECG may take some time, right? So first you may ask a history, is there an abrupt onset? Is there any predisposing factor like uh, there is hypovolemia or diarrhea or the child is... Uh, uh, having pain or anxiety, is there a history? Or is there a vague history, sometimes palpitation, a sudden abrupt onset, then it is supraventricular. If there is a predisposing like fever, hypovolemia, it is sinus you have to think about. Then when we look at the yeast monitor, in supraventricular tachycardia, the rhythm, it's like it won't change. It's like a stitched pattern. You might see a same rhythm pattern. In sinus tachycardia, there is beat to beat variability. That is what you see in ECG as RR interval is uh, changing, right? So here, uh, the, you know, the SVT is constant RR interval, and there is no beat to beat variability. There will be the heart rate is between 212 and 20. It won't range down to 200 or 220. It's like there won't be might vary, much variation in the SVT. Like you might ask for a look at the QRS, it is already you would have sent the narrow complex, and then you take an ECG and you confirm. You might, in an acute situation, you may not be able to take an ECG. You may have to act considering the monitor and super wide narrow complex. It's supraventricular, it's abnormally uh, high heart rate and with a history. And as uh, we had the ECG findings. And uh, if the child is stable, you might use a, a pack like this, a cold pack, ice pack like this not to give pressure on the eyes or a Valsalva maneuver. And then you give an adenosine. That is very important. And there are techniques involved in that that will be demoed through the assimilation. It's a three-way technique is there. And you can see in a video, the dose is 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg. When we administer technically correct, there will be a change. But I won't say that it will not be reverted, but if there is it is touched the heart and they will know that then there will be a change and it might begin back. If it is no change, the technique is not. Why the technique is important? It has to reach within 10 seconds to the AV node because otherwise it is sequestrated by the RBC. The lifespan is uh, less than 10 seconds. You see a video of the, how they are giving this. This is a three-way technique taking drug in one syringe and the flush in the other one. So you will be seeing this again in your demo. Probably I'll just show once more. Drug followed by the flush. And why QRS, we talked about the pulseless ventricular tachycardia, but can ventricular tachycardia with pulse and poor perfusion also can occur? That's beyond the scope of this lecture. So I'm not going into this late. But we know white complex tachycardia is always, you need to think about uh, ventricular tachycardia and whether there is pulse or not, no pulse. That's white complex you are seeing here. And next is the chaotic rhythm. As I told, it's scribbling like and it's ventricular fibrillation. These, uh, this is a cardiac arrest rhythm, which already we discussed. So in summary, you need to remember healthy neonates and infants have a faster heart rate than adults. ECG variations, which I didn't talk about, there are variations from adults. And you need to remember the most common arrest rhythm is the bradycardia followed by asystole, not the shockable rhythms. But shockable rhythms are important to be identified because if you shock in right time, you can the outcome can be good and survival is best. Always remember again, the heart rate is less than 60 with poor perfusion, despite adequate your oxygenation, you have to start chest compression. And look at the hemodynamic stability of the child in any tachyarrhythmias or abnormal rhythm, rhythm. Treat the patient and not the rhythm. And uh, well, I'll stop here. And then uh, hand over to Sh Shanuf to continue on the newborn resuscitation. And then we will, if we have time, then we can show the choking. Otherwise, we'll go for the simulation-based uh, demo. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Agosar and BSU team for giving this opportunity. In the next 20 minutes, I'll be uh, giving an all. Uh, so a few of the things. One is, uh, I will go through a few questions so that by the end of the presentation, uh, I will be able to answer. So 32 weeks for 1.5 kg preterm is delivered and suddenly baby require intubation. What says ET2 we will select? So I'll come to it later. What is the expected saturation of a normally born term baby at five minutes of life? That also in the first 10 minutes saturation improves. That also I'll come to that. Chest compression should be started if the heart rate remains less than 60 per minute after at least how many seconds of adequate positive pressure ventilation. And uh, contraindication for Dagan mask ventilation in newborn, expand MR SOPA. MR SOPA is the one uh, thing which is uh, mentioning in uh, NRP but not in pulse or anything. And what is the best indicator for successful presentation? So, so delivery room presentation is a primitive bridge between the OG and the NACU. So knowing about the newborn presentation is very important as we know that 3, 3 to 5 percentage of uh, Indian babies develop birth restriction. Shano, can you make yeah. it as a slideshow, yeah, please? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So 3 to 5 percentage of babies develop birth asphyxia. And uh, out of all deliveries, 10 percentage of babies require some assistance to begin breathing, like stimulation or dagan mask. And less than 1 percentage require ex extensive resuscitative measures uh, to the extent of uh, drugs and chest compression. So knowing the uh, sequence of uh, resuscitation, and we should be prepared and dispensed, and we should be prepared for uh, giving the resuscitation. So, Usual thing is baby cries at birth and after uh, one minute or two minutes, baby uh, will found to be uh, not breathing. That is the usual scenario. So that is, uh, we label this primary of secondary apnea, but uh, first and foremost thing to know is the apnea after baby take a breath is mostly due to obstructive apnea, which can be due to secretion. So suction is suction is the most important part comes to that. So, if the baby requires bagan mask to the extent of bagan mask, it will be like a secondary apnea because after baby lies in a period of primary apnea for some time, baby will go into secondary apnea. Then the baby will have hypotension, and at that time, baby will require bagan mask ventilation. So, we should be prepared for resuscitation. We should anticipate in all deliveries, we should anticipate baby can uh, cry at birth, baby can uh, born without uh, immediate cry. So in uh, situations like adipatum risk factors like hypertension, previous uh, neonatal death, and IUGR, and maternal anemia, or infrapartum factors like uh, adipatum hemorrhage, fetal distress, PROM, or mother on GA anesthesia, or metonium stain like that. All these uh, particular indication, uh, particular situations, you should anticipate baby recovery in the situation. So in 50 percentage of cases it can occur unexpectedly. So all deliveries should be attended, anticipating baby might require some amount of resuscitation. So as for any, uh, uh, like immediately, uh, suddenly cardiac arrest happens, uh, baby become unresponsive. This is like uh, we are just going prepared for resuscitation in a delivery room. So we should be ready with the equipments, whatever equipments needed. And uh, you should check and make sure that everything is uh, working. Like uh, laryngoscope and bagan uh, and uh, labor room. And another thing is pre uh, the uh, radiant bomber 10 minutes before the uh, delivery. And we should have the pre cloth also to uh, cover the baby. And one, one dedicated person who knows uh, resuscitation, basic resuscitation should be present and there should be have a checklist and should be uh, So the rule is TABC, temperature, airway, breathing, circulation. So unlike in uh, pediatric and adults, the first two, two foremost things are uh, to make that maintain the temperature normal. So that is the first and foremost thing and maintain the airway. So we will Circulation uh, is comes the last. So once the baby is born, so we should uh, see whether baby is term or preterm, whether baby is uh, crying or breathing, and the third thing is whether baby is having a good tone. So if the baby satisfies all those things, like baby is a term baby, 
baby is crying and baby is stone is good so we will go with the initial steps and we will keep with the mother on uh, baby with the mother side or mother's first so initial steps are uh, nothing but uh, wiping the baby uh, covering with a uh, warm cloth and uh, if needed baby will uh, will give uh, suction and stimulation so uh, wiping and uh, covering with a warm cloth is the first and foremost thing so to, this is to prevent the heat loss uh, radial warmer is there which can keep the baby under radial warmer or we can keep over the mother's uh, chest also positioning if we are keeping the baby in the warmer uh, keep the baby uh, with the neck slightly extended in a stiffening position with a 1 inch uh, shoulder roll below the uh, uh, shoulder upper shoulder to keep the airway open and you should be ready with a suction apparatus with 8 to 8 8 to 10 8, 8 size 8 to 10 french size and suction pressure should be 100 mm of mercury suction is given a moral suction and then uh, nasal suction and only if the the baby has uh, visible secretions or breathing difficulty. Tactile stimulation also, if needed, we can give tactile stimulation. That is by rubbing the back or flicking the cells. So, the first 10 minute saturation that we should know. For one minute, it will be 60 to 65, and by five minutes, it will be 80 to 85, and 10 minutes, 80. So, no need to bother if the saturation is 70 or uh, 80 at uh, 3 to 5 minutes of life. So, we should uh, proceed our station depending on the baby's heart rate. So, I will come to the uh, sequence. So, the initial steps which I have told, like uh, wiping the baby, covering with the trilin and positioning and uh, suctioning and stimulation if needed. All this should take less uh, less than 30 seconds and by 30 seconds you should see the baby's heart rate by using the stethoscope and see the baby's breathing so you can see uh, if the baby's heart rate is less than 100 or baby is not breathing or gasping then you should proceed with the positive pressure ventilation by this time you should connect the spo2 monitor probe to the right upper limb for getting the preductive saturation and the most is um, the best indicator for successful uh, positive pressure ventilation is the improvement in heart rate and followed by the uh, rise in uh, chest movements. So if the baby's uh, heart rate is more than 100 and breathing, but labored breathing is there, you can start delivery room CPAP by using Neopuff or TP's resistator. So positive pressure ventilation, uh, you will start indications for positive this is, this is the previous 2015 algorithm. There is some uh, differences uh, with respect to 2020, which came uh, last year. So you can see the sequence of initial steps, palm and maintain normal temperature, position the airway, clear secretions if needed, and stimulate, stimulation comes the last. So palm, uh, maintain temperature and position airway. These are the two main things. And then you should go, you should see the heart rate after that and see for apnea or whether the baby's heart rate is less than 100 or baby is not breathing or gasping, you should start with the positive pressure ventilation. So it takes around 10 minutes for the baby to reach uh, uh, saturation more than 90. So the assessment you should uh, do by seeing the uh, chest rise and rise in heart rate and pulse. As I have told, pulse oximeter should be connected uh, before the station. This is the normal increase in pulse oximetry values. So how will you give positive pressure ventilation at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute? So you can uh, tell like back on two or uh, back two, three like that. So then it will give deliver around 40 to 60 breaths per, breaths per minute. And uh, it should see, it should give a good seal so that there should be a chest rise. And it is uh, similar to easy technique. Uh, newborn also will do the same thing. But only thing is, if the, there is no adequate chest rise, then you should think of ventilation corrective steps, which is called by the mnemonic MR SOPA. So this is the requirement is, uh, uh, we'll start with the 20 by 5. If you are giving uh, positive breaths using Neopuff, 20 centimeter of PIP and 5 centimeter of P, uh, P, PWP. So improvement in uh, baby's response is by increasing heart rate. That is the most important thing. 
second only is the improving saturation. So MR SOPA is reapply the mass and R4 reposition the airway. So if you give, after giving five turns, you should see whether baby is having chest press and increase in heart rate. So if it is not there, just uh, reapply the mask, take the mask and apply the mask properly so that it will give the good seat. And if the uh, reposition the airway by slightly flexing or extending. And see uh, whether continue the uh, bag and mask. If again give another five breaths and see if it is still chest raise is not there, you should uh, do suction and open, open and you should do suction, open mouth and then give bag and mask. And last thing is to increase the pressure and alternative. So this is MR SOPA, that is the mnemonic for ventilation corrective steps if there is no effective chest rise with the bagan mass ventilation. So advanced resuscitation means maybe requiring intubation or requiring drugs, intubation, uh, chest compression or requiring drugs. Only two drugs which are indicated in NRP is uh, uh, epinephrine, adrenaline and normal sign. So coming to uh, endotracheal intubation, we will intubate if we anticipate prolonged ventilation on, or when, if the baby reaches a stage of going into chest compression. And uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a relative contraindication for bag and mask. In that situation also, we will go ahead with the direct endotracheal intubation. Compression. And chest compression, there should be two, two persons should be needed. And it should be provided at a rate of 90 per minute and in the ratio of 3 is to 1. Unlike in child, you will give uh, 15 is to 2. Here it is 3 is to 1. As uh, airway or oxygenation is the, ventilation is the uh, predominant problem in newborn. So the preferred method is two thumb encircling method and the latest NRP is uh, telling to two finger method is not a preferred method. And when you are giving chest compression, assess the heart rate every 30 seconds. You should give till chest uh, heart rate more than 60. If the heart rate is less than 60, even after one minute of uh, effective chest compression and ventilation, then you should think of adrenaline. So I will go through some three, four uh, differences in the uh, recent NRP, eighth edition of uh, NRP, which has come uh, in 2020. So, uh, this is the, uh, the, the sequence is almost the same. This is the differences. So, initial steps, the sequence is warm, dry, stimulate, position and airway, position the airway and suction if needed. This is the sequence. And when, whenever we are thinking of an alternative, when you are intubating the baby, ideally it should be ECG. It should be connected. It is the most accurate method of assessment of baby's heart rate. And dosage of the uh, drugs also, they have, uh, previously it was like uh, it is in range 0.1 to 0.3 mg per kg. Now the endotracheal dose is 0.1 mg per kg. That means 1 ml per kg of uh, 1 in 10,000. 1 ml per kg of 1 in 10,000 adrenaline. And IV dose is 0.2 ml per kg of 1 in 10,000. And flushing, previously it was told 1, 1 ml. 0.5 to 1 ml. Now we should flush adrenaline with a 3 ml of normal sign. And you should give for continuous 20 minutes and then only you should decide on discontinuing the resuscitation. And that also individually is depending on the, uh, the after discussing with the team members and the family members. So 20 minutes is the time frame there. So these are the uh, prominent changes in the reset and and uh, by 2015 itself, it has come that meconium aspiration syndrome, the uh, resuscitation should be as like uh, any other uh, baby repairing resuscitation. No routine uh, EG suctioning, baby repair EG suctioning only if uh, uh, baby is not no effective chest rise after uh, intubation, after bag and mask and intubation. So, NRP is not a pulse uh, newborn, it is the process is. Uh, sequence so temperature, airway, breathing, circulation, few additional things like uh, MR SOPA and uh, the chest compression to ventilation uh, ratio is uh, 
3 is to 1. And size of the ET2 depends on the baby's uh, uh, weight. 1 to 2 kg, usually 1 to 2 kg is 3 size. 1 to 3, but one like 1 to 3. 1 to 2 kg is 3 size. 2 to 2, 3 kg is 3.5. And the smallest uh, minute babies uh, use 2.5 kg. I will share a, I will show a video before finishing. Is it video is uh, being shared, sir? Yeah, yeah, but you can start from the beginning. Yeah. Probably. yeah. So this is just, uh, we have made a video, demo video today. So just uh, by the baby and uh, see for the after initial steps, see for the breathing and heart rate. This is hospital table. Heart rate less than 100 starting uh, Nagan mass. So there is no chest rise. After five breaths, there is no chest rise. So after five breaths, positioning uh, the airway, reposition the airway, reapply the mask and going again five breaths. There is chest rise is there. So we suspending for the heart rate. Heart rate more than 100 and baby is breathing, we can. So every five, sec five breaths, you can uh, do the ventilation corrective steps and make sure that baby is having chest rise and uh, increase in heart rate. So, few things in this uh, video. So, we should give time for relaxation of the chest, like in a pediatric. And bagging should be gentle with the using two fingers other than the thumb, use two to three fingers so that pressure will be 15 to 20 centimeters. If the baby requires high pressures, you can increase the uh, use all the five fingers. Any questions from the audience? Any, any, uh... And we are going to have the simulation based uh, demonstration here. Before that, I just want to share and uh, about the team dynamics, which is very important. Um, in especially CPR in all the crit critical aspects is very important. Okay, so when we have a team, we need to have a minimum of about six people. And then as you know, the team leader has to have a mirror image. That means they have to walk at the footstep, seeing everything overall. And you have an airway compressor and a monitor and a defibrillator with a medication person and a recorder. Now we need to remember there is another person called CPR coach or the defibrillator can function as a CPR coach. What does that mean? To emphasize on the high quality CPR. That is the push hard, push fast to encourage and to minimize the timing. That person is also can be included in the team as same but you know in our circumstances very difficult to have such a ideal team at least you need to have three people that is airway compressor and a defibrillator with a live triangle okay because it's very what is that the pit stoppers where they position themselves and do a perfect job in the formula one in a crisis situation in a, a medical field also we need to have that position so that we can be precisely follow the crisis resource management principle. We should have an exercise leadership and followership. Here there is not what is on, concentrate on what is right, not who is right. Because patient is the important thing in our focus. Communicate effectively, that is the closed loop communication is very important as you know, what is meant is not said, said is not heard, heard is not understood and understood is not done. So the closed loop communication, is very, very important. And about uh, uh, situational awareness, you need to know your environment, you need to know your team, you need to know your equipment and your patient as well. 
as yourself, right? You need to know what you are doing. Situational awareness is important and avoid target fixation. Not only one part, it's the holistic care of the child and then you will do a good job and, uh, and we will see this team leadership and uh, followership and the team dynamics in our uh, demonstration as well. So over to simulation team that uh, in the simulation center. They're going to demonstrate uh, CPR and uh, arrhythmia management. All right, so uh, welcome to the simulation lab in CMC. And we are going to demonstrate our team is here. You can show the team and uh, Dr. Sanket, uh, Suranjan, John and uh, John Cezia and Benson and Dr. Vandana. So uh, before going to that, a quick demo of the defibrillator. So you may have different defibrillators in your centers, but the steps are always the same. Can you focus on here, please? So this is a manual defibrillator. So as we know, can you show the proof? Yeah. So the manual defibrillator, we give use it for many purposes. The important things are this is used for defibrillation, that is shock. Default, it is made for that. And then synchronized cardioversion. Third, it can be used for uh, transcutaneous pacing also. And the can be used as an automated external defibrillator. The first, as I said, default is the defibrillator. The first defibrillation we give, as I told you, for shockable rhythms, that's pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. In these two shockable rhythms, we use defibrillation starting with a joule of two joules per kilo, followed by four joules and going up to 10 joules maximum. Or in an adult, you'll give 150 or 200 joules. The second is synchronized cardioversion, that is for using an unstable supraventricular tachycardia and the unstable ventricular tachycardia. That means you have a white complex tachy with pulse with poor perfusion. All right, so we are not going into that detail. I'll just tell you the steps. So how to take your uh, uh, pad pills. These are called paddles, okay? It will be, we have to take it with small inflammation and remove that. And these are adult paddles, which can be used for child also. But for an infant, you can just, there is a button here or a lever here, you press it and take it and this is for an infant that is for less than 10 kgs or one year so that is you need to remember any mode of model of the defibrillator will have this and then you can uh, use it for young infants otherwise if you don't you can't take it you can use it as one i was saying you can use it in the anglo posterior as well as a defibrillator paddles okay so first step you have taken, and then you need to have the gel in place. You need to apply, that is very, very important. And then you will charge. The charge can be done through this. So you will, as I told, two joules. If the 20 kilo, 40 joules. If this 40 is not there, you may go to 50, the highest joules, okay? Right, so joules are selected here. So what is the next step is just charging. So the charging can be done by pressing two here, or there is an yellow, can I focus here? There is an yellow button here on the paddle which says Apex. Paddle which says Apex, there is an yellow button. You can do that as well. Either here or the button two. In the, you press it and the charge. So advisably, you have to keep it near the patient. Focus here. Then you have to keep it near the patient and then charging is better for safety reason. That's what this is button is given. So after charging, you will give, deliver the shot by pressing these two buttons. That is two orange buttons. So before that, one important step is that, that you make sure everybody is clear and the oxygen is off as it can be dangerous to the team as well as for the environment. So you need to be very careful about that. So three steps, you take the paddles and put gel, select the appropriate paddles, and then you select switch on and select the jewels and 
charge either through button pressing that yellow button over here or two in this and then third is just delivering the shot before that make sure everybody is clear this delivering is always better to use but there is another provision here as well third button also can be pressed by somebody else but is always better to use near the patient this is default it's a defibrillator used for cardiac arrest situations but there is another important uh, function is this cardio version there is a sync button synchronize yeah so there is a sync button here to press that same step you may press to sync that is why as i told only an unstable supraventricular tachycardia and unstable ventricular tachycardia there is ventricular tachycardia with pulse and poor perfusion so in that circumstances you will use so in that circumstances you use synchronized cardio version that is less juice because the patient is alive having an abnormal and poorly perfusing use a lesser juice of 0.5 to 1 joules per kilo all right so now they are going to demonstrate a, a team performance over to the team thank you going to they are going to demonstrate uh, cardiac arrest with a uh, situation and dr vandana is the team leader and she will take it from here yes uh, team today we have a 5 year old child who accidentally fell into the uh, well and is come now uh, please connect the monitor and uh, connect the oxygen and okay is he responsive Are you okay? No, he is not responsive. Uh, can you please it. check the pulse? ECG is showing some activity. Can you check the pulse? There is no pulse. No pulse. It must be PEA. Can we start uh, some chest compression, sister? Can you please put in an IV line and get One, ready with three, resuscitation three, drugs, please? Four, Yeah, you are giving me fifteen minutes to do. Very good. Please go on. Adrenaline, can we give uh, two ml of one is to ten thousand? Adrenaline, opening. I'm giving you adrenaline. Two ml, one in ten thousand. Two ml, one in ten thousand. Thank you very much. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. One, two. If we have finished five cycles, can we change over? and uh, please uh, see the uh, pulse please again see the heart rate rhythm rhythm is not regular yet and uh, pulse is not palpable more, one more adrenaline please one more two ml of one is to 10000 we'll continue cpr one two three ml one is 10000 administered 8 9 10 11 12 thank 13, you so much 14, for the adrenaline 15, 15, we'll continue 15, 15, 15, 15. The rhythm is changing. It is a wide pulse pressure. Which pulse is there? Can we please check the pulse again? No, there is no, no pulse. No pulse. It it must be a, a, a ventricular fibrillation without pulse. Can we, Doctor Sankir, please get ready for the um, shock? Let's continue CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, so we are giving 10, 2 joules per kg 10, 20 30, is 20 40, 50, kilos so 40 joules per 1, kg we are giving 2 one 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10, i'm ready with the battle 13 fourteen, fifteen. good job surajan good job i'm applying jelly here and the child is being 20 kg child 2 joules per kg so 40 joules we will deliver 
and I have charged with 40 yeah. joules here because 40 is not there. I will select the next maximum value of 40 and I will press the charge button here. And one one at the apex and the other at the one at the below the right clavicle and the other at the apex. One third charge. I am clear, all clear. Option disconnected. I am going to deliver the shop. Shop delivered. Continue CPR, please. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine, ten. I, and, uh, 11, chest two, compression 30, should be little 40, deeper, Suranjan, if 60. you don't mind. Little deeper. One, two. two. Okay. One, two, two and three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Very good. One. Good job. Two. Can we change over now and then? Um, see the rhythm. I think the rhythm is uh, heart rate is 178. Is there any pulse? Can we check, please? No it pulse. looks like a white complex uh, 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 rhythm and no pulse. So we'll continue CPR, but in the meantime, you can start uh, one more shot at 4 joules per kg. Suranjan, it looks like ventricular tachycardia. Can we administer one more one, dose of adrenaline? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you for reminding us. Uh, can we can give one more adrenaline to ML? The charge is defibrillator. I'm ready for administration shock. Injection adrenaline to ML, one in 10,000 administered. I'm here. All here. Disconnect oxygen. Shock delivered. Good job, uh, uh, Benson. I think we'll uh, see the um, uh, pulse and the rhythm. Rhythm looks okay. Is the pulse go uh, good? How no, much is no it? Pulse. No pulse. So it's still in PEA. Can we continue? Are we missing anything? And if we see that uh, 6 H's and 6 T's. The child was drowned, no? so how would be the temperature, sister? I think it's very cold. 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, glucose, blood glucose. I'll check the glucose. Um, John, can you please give us any ABG values of uh, potassium, please? Can yeah, you see? 30 no, grams. PaO2, two. hypoxia, any hypoxia is One, there? Two. Can, can you ask? Somebody uh, in between, can we ask you for any uh, pneumothorax? GRBS is 31 to give some. Oh, GRBS is 31. Can we give one 5 ml per kg of 10% uh, uh, dextrose as a stat? IV bolus. Injection 10% dextrose, 100 ml connected. Okay, can we see the rhythm again? Parentry is very good. Thank you, Benson. Uh, the rhythm is written. Pulse. What about the pulse? Yeah, I can feel the pulse now. Very good. So we have reverted the uh, rhythm into sinus rhythm. Thank you, team, for your resuscitative efforts. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. So it is uh, wonderful to see you guys perform. Can you come here? We'll have a quick uh, uh, debriefing of what has happened. So, uh, Dr. Vandana, can you please tell the narrate this incident and what was the thing? Yeah, so we had a five-year-old child who accidentally fell into the well and he came. Um, he came unresponsive. There was no pulses and uh, he was not breathing. So we started him on CPR and gave uh, bag and mask ventilation. But through the uh, ECG, we could see that he was in PEA. And uh, that's the reason we started, continued CPR. Sure. And, but he reverted to... Uh, ventricular fibrillation and then we had to give him shock two joules per kg but he didn't revert and went into uh, ventricular tachycardia but uh, uh, we could um, then PEA because we had not caught the uh, hypo hypoxia and hypothermia in the initial stages we also had hypoglycemia which we had to correct so sure. so thanks uh, Vandana you just narrated what happened so I would like to have, uh, your team dynamics was good. I could notice that there was leadership, followership, and there was close look communication. Your messages were clear. Thank you team for that wonderful job. So here, come on, just learning points. I just go back onto the rhythm that you are seeing in the monitor. Those who are listening, so you can see on the monitor there is a rhythm. Uh, there is no, can you take out the blood pressure please? So when the child was unresponsive and they found there is no pulse, but there was a rhythm. But you may not have a 
organized rhythm like this, but you may have some sort of a rhythm with some or not the number, but if there is no pulse, that is pulseless electrical activity. So you have to, the only thing you have to do is CPR and adrenaline. That was followed in there, right? So it is a non-shockable rhythm. So you identify that and then you did. That is good job. Anything else you could have done better, Sanket? Uh, because it's uh, pulseless electrical activity, we should have thought about the correctable causes. Absolutely. So the reversible causes has to come a little earlier for the pulseless electrical activity. In all cardiac arrest, you need to think about that. That is the six hydrous and six or five T's which we talked about. The important things are in T's in children are pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax and tamponade. And other heights in children, it's a hypoglycemia also has been added for children. So that in this child, you had hypothermia and hypoglycemia, which is reverted. Can you put on the rhythm too? So that is non-shockable rhythm. Another non-shockable rhythm is the asystole. Now that you are seeing a rhythm in the monitor, that was the second one which we saw, that is the ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation. And now you are seeing a flat line, but now the rhythm is changing to a chaotic rhythm, like a disorganized rhythm. So that is the ventricular fibrillation, which is a shockable rhythm that exactly they did a two joules per kilo of uh, defibrillation was given. Any other condition, Shuranjan, we can give defibrillation? Beta. Pulseless Beta. ventricular Beta. tachycardia. Can you put the next one, please? Pulseless ventricular tachycardia, which is different from fibrillation in that it might have a little bit of an organized white complex tachycardia. In ventricular fibrillation, there is no organized rhythm. But here in uh, white complex, you have a white QRS complex, but no pulse. That's called pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Here also you defibrillate, right? And how many joules can get you use? We started first was four joules per kg, then second was four joules. Four, four joules. joules per kilo, that has been. And then the child again went to PEA, and then you thought about the reversible causes, and the child, you did the correctable causes, uh, treated that, and the child was... Uh, child attained ROSC, that is the return of spontaneous circulation. Thank you. And one more uh, scenario is that, that we'll talk about what I told about tachyarrhythmias, that whether narrow complex or white complex, that you will be seeing now as a scenario in a supraventricular tachycardia, how do they manage and how they give adenosine and the synchronized cardio version. Over to you, Renan. Okay, team, are we ready? Yeah, uh, we have a five-year-old child who's come with fever and some palpitation. Um, uh, uh, can we check out uh, him? Um, okay. Uh, how, what is the color, breathing, and circulation? Is it okay? Yeah, he's pink in color. Okay. His response with Jesus is 15 by 15. Okay. But he's just feeling some uncomfortable. Uncomfortableness. Pain. Okay. Can we start high flow oxygen with the rebreather mask? Connect him to the monitor. Monitor is connected. Uh, heart rate is 222. Oh my God. And it is uh, regular, narrow, complex, and stitch patterned uh, ECGs I can see. So um, I think it is uh, SVT. Uh, Jan, can, we, can you provide us with ice so that we can do some Valsalva maneuver? Yes, then, sir, yes. if you have a straw with you, can you give him to blow into it? Um, nothing is working, then we can give a. Uh, um, this is the ice pack that is kept in between the eyes. No action, I think. There's no change. The yeah, give him the straw, please. I think no response. We have tried the manoeuvre. That is also yeah. there was no response with that. You can give one carotid massage from your side, uh, Sanket. I think no use. Sister, can we get uh, ready with adenosine so that we can, when you are ready, let us know. We will uh, uh, give adenosine. So we are using uh, now 0.1 mg per kg. Uh, so it is 20 kilos. So we'll give 2 mg. So which technique are you using, Dr. Sanket? Three-way technique I'm going to use. Okay. Uh, so because uh, 
So this is the adenosine. Child is a 20 kg child. This is the adenosine and uh, this is the flesh uh, we are loaded with. Uh, so child being a 20 kg child, 0.1 mg per kg of adenosine, that is 2 mg will give. Uh, because sometimes it can cause hypotension. We are uh, ready with uh, adrenal and bolus also and incubation set also we are ready. Sure, thank you so much for that. So this is a three-way technique where I have uh, fixed adenosine here. Once I administer the adenosine here, yeah. then I will change the pre like this. Uh -huh. So that they will, uh, this the is flesh the will give the flesh. Because adenosine has a very uh, small half-life of 10 seconds. It has to be given in a very uh, rapid way. Rapid way. And okay. it has to be given in the nearest possible IV line. I think this one foot line is there. This is the nearest possible to the heart. So you can go on and give it the flush method. So I'm going to Yeah, I'm ready give, with uh, flesh. Adenosine. Oh. Immediately I'll turn the yeah. way so that you can give So Ranjan, yes. have your eyes on the ECG, please. Yes. Yeah. Flushing done. Yeah. Thank you. It's reverted. I think it's working. Good. Very good. Um, his uh, vitals are stable, 91 by 47. Uh, oh my God, it's reverted again. Uh, can we try a higher dose? Uh, sister, yeah. let yeah, us know when you're ready. Yeah, I know since ready. Okay. So now we will try with a higher dose of 0.2 mg per kg. So 4 mg we will give. Okay. Uh, this time we will use the technique of uh, not changing the three-way. Okay. So I will... So all the all the valves are open. Now I will give the adenosine so that she will hold the flush tight so that the adenosine doesn't go this way. Okay. Once I give it... So here, you both want to have the plunger on and uh, give a sustained uh, pressure. Very good. Yeah. Go so on. I give. Yeah. So then then eyes on the ECG, please. Yes. Yeah. Good, very good. We'll wait for two seconds if it is reverting or not. Yeah, I think it is sustainably reverting. But uh, BP is showing 75 by 29. is becoming unstable uh, and reverting back. I think we need to now give him a uh, DC cardio version, please. Uh, he'll become unstable. So Sanket is 20 kilos. So how much are you giving the shock? How much uh, juice are you giving? So this being an unstable SVT, uh, yeah. I'm going to give a synchronized cardio version. Okay. Uh, synchronized cardio version, the dose is 0.5 joules per kg. Okay. So it has to be synced with the R wave and then delivered. So the, where we should select the sync button, yes, think more we should switch it on. We have to select the joules. So 10 joules we have selected. I have to apply the daily here in both the sides. The paddle says because the child is 20 kg, I will select the bigger paddles. So this one is placed on the right side of the clavicle, below the right clavicle, and this one at the apex. Adrenaline is ready uh, if you have any issues, Dr. Sankit. Yeah. yeah. Adrenaline is ready. Keep him in also ready for sedation. The child is uh, awake, so we'll. Probably give a small dose of ketamine, 1 mg per kg, 20 kg ketamine. Sure, sure. Ketamine, 20 mg, uh, please give Dr. Uh, sister Jansi, please. So press the sync button and charge with 10 joules. Yeah. Ketamine, 20 mg given. Yeah. Ketamine given, you can go ahead. I'm ready with the uh, this of this thing. So I'm going to deliver shock. I'm clear, all clear. Disconnect oxygen. Shock delivered. Yeah, we can see a change in the ECG. The heart rate is also coming down to 178. Looks like a sinus and sustained. Uh, good job, all the team. Uh, BP is also slightly coming up. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vantana. It was nice uh, seeing you, uh, your team doing a good job as team then with a good team dynamics as well as the effective management of a child with a supraventricular tachycardia. So here we learned the patient with supraventricular tachycardia initially, as I told, in any tachycardia image, we will be looking at the patient. That's very important. The hemodynamic status. So in first session, this child was stable with supraventricular tachycardia. What they diagnosed? 
that is looking at the monitor, the heart rate for the six years old was around 220. And it looked like a stitch pattern, the sense it was not showing any beat to beat variability. So, P waves could not be identified, but even in a sinus, when you have a higher heart rate, it might be difficult. But the beat to beat variability is very important. And another important thing is history no precipitating condition. It's an immediate or abrupt onset with some palpitation or vague complaints. So then they tried the. Then they tried the. Uh, uh, just passive processes. So then, then they, they tried, tried the, the, the ice packs, and ice since being a child, uh, carotid massage was given, it was not reverting, adenosine was given. So that technique I appreciate, they showed two techniques, three-way technique, and flush, and closing, and opening, but the two people should be communicated very well. As I told earlier, that lifespan is very short, so it has to reach the heart within 10 seconds. There was some change in the rhythm, that means it touched the node, but it reverted back again to SVT. The child was unstable and they'd used a synchronized cardioversion. Why they use lesser joule, that's 0.5 to 1 joules per kilo, and synchronized button, and it was synchronized with the ECG lead of the patient. And this is the important step in synchronized cardioversion, which was done. And the patient reverted back. Thank you very much, team. And uh, I would like to stop here and we'll take any questions. And over to Jairaj for uh, discussions, please. Thank you. Uh, no, I think it was a very uh, extensive, wonderful presentation. And as well as uh, the telecin, which uh, really, uh, helped everybody understand and especially with the presentation of all the various arrhythmias um, I think it, it I, I miss it <laughs> so uh, just a few things I thought uh, important things uh, I just wanted to put some points uh, one was uh, when we started important to understand the pediatric assessment triangle because the first look of the patient always uh, uh, tells us uh, like we have to that's a skill that we develop so pediatric assessment triangle is uh, very very important I feel uh, even the statistics as Dr. Vandana had said that 8% of outside hospital and only 43% of in hospital patients survive to discharge our thing is the faster we pick up the better the neurological outcome um, and one more line which Dr. Vandana said that during CPR, we are the heart and lungs. So we've got to think like that and act like that. Uh, sometimes in wards, I've noticed, uh, or even in ICU, staff will tell you that uh, the saturation of a patient is fluctuating or they're not able to pick up. I think uh, those are warning signs which have to be dealt with at that particular moment. Um, one more important thing I thought, uh, especially for people in various peripheral hospitals, uh, whether it be a pediatric adult or a geriatric age group, uh, glucose is a must when a patient or a child count is brought to emergency. So uh, these are a few things. Um, I, I want to thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to uh, be here. And, nice uh, to see you, Jairaj, and uh, yes, it was sir. a pleasure as ours.